Good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'm Mike Traskos. I'm the president of Electromat. And today I'll be talking about wiring cable applications in aerospace. It's a little bit different industry than we've been hearing for the last uh, day or two. So hopefully it will be able to be of interest to you here today. I'll go over um, several points here, talk about applications, requirements of aerospace cables, and a little bit how they differ from your appliance wire and we're talking about power systems, smart grid, all that. Talk about what's necessary from an aerospace perspective, certification requirements, and also talk about some of the current trends that we're seeing in the aerospace industry. I'll talk about the developments of new products, new technologies, and the future that I see for wire and cable in aerospace. Just a little bit of background about what Electromech is and who we are. We were founded in 1984, so we're a 30 year old company, and since we were founded, we focused on wire system assessment, degradation, and since that time, we've been performing a lot of certification tests for wire manufacturers. We've done a lot of work with the American uh, Federal Aviation Administration, military, NASA, a lot of organizations we've done work for. We're currently working with the United States Air Force to help them identify and come up with a plan to extend the life of their system and platforms. Before I get into all the nitty gritty, I want to talk about the important concepts that we see in aerospace wire and cable. First, consequences of wire failure are high. And in the next two slides, I'll show you what incidents and what accidents uh, were caused uh, by wire and cable failure. When designers are designing the aircraft, there are two main considerations that they have in mind. First, operational requirements. What's the environment within the aircraft? Voltage, temperature, cycling between high and cold, all those operational requirements. The wire needs to be designed to get through a, not only a single cycle, but typically it has to last the life of the aircraft, which is, from a commercial perspective, 25 to 30 years on average. The second main consideration for designers is weight. Weight is critical. Weight costs, if you add weight to an aircraft, it costs a lot of money. In the next slide, I'll actually show you uh, how much it costs to have an additional pound on an aircraft. For a designer, if a wire manufacturer or a connector manufacturer, any equipment can be put on the aircraft and it can save a pound, two, it is a, an excellent product. It's a viable product for manufacturers. They are looking to save weight because it increases the economic viability of their products. Lastly, wiring must be thought of as a system, not just as an individual component. Up to the mid-90s, wiring was thought of as fit and forget. Place it on the aircraft and never touch it again. And then a couple incidents that happened in the late 1990s changed that method of thinking. Uh, Electromech went through service difficulty reports, or a reporting system that all U.S. commercial operators have to report to, and what we found is that once every five days in the United States, an aircraft is diverted as a forced early landing due to smoke or fire, and that's caused by electrical wire failure. Well, not just wire, but connectors and other parts of the electrical distribution system. So I talked about the economics of weight. Weight is critical. For every pound or 0.44 kilograms of equipment that's on an aircraft, that costs an additional $1,000, at least based on the current technology, over the life of that aircraft. Like I said, the aircraft typically is 25 to 30 years of service life. So if you can save some weight on aircraft, basically the operators can see the economic benefit of that. I'm also going to be talking about applications of spacecraft during this presentation. The fuel cost using the current technology to get one pound of payload into orbit is $10,000. Obviously, there's a huge interest there to keep weight low on platforms and get them into space as light as possible. So requirements of aerospace wire and cable. There's right now the typical standard that a lot of the aerospace wire and cable is tested to is SAE AS4373. You may not be familiar with it. That's fine. This standard contains more than 60 tests. Now, not all wire and cable have to go through each of these tests but your typical aerospace cable or wire will need to go through at least 30 of these. These include chemical, electrical, mechanical, and aging and thermal tests. From a chemical perspective, aerospace wires see a lot of different environments. It gets soaked in hydraulic fluids, exposure to fuel. There's 
different types of hydraulic fluids. There's different types of fuel. If you're in the southern United States, the fuel is lighter, less dense than what you would get if you filled up your aircraft in Canada. Those are different compounds and they affect wire differently. The fluid immersion tests for aerospace wire and cable include 20 different types of fluids. And there's actually debate right now in some of the committees as to if we should, one, add additional fluids to that, and two, if the duration of the fluid exposure properly represents the environment. From the mechanical perspective, aircraft operate in high temperature and also low temperature. When the aircraft is sitting on the tarmac in Dubai or any other warm place on the planet, those wires can be exposed to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. When the aircraft's in flight, that can be negative 55 degrees Celsius. So that's where a cold bend test comes in. There's flex testing, dynamic cut through, both at ambient and operational temperatures. There's a lot of mechanical tests that go into verifying the performance in the aerospace wire and cable. Electrical tests, there's typical dielectric uh, withstand testing, corona extinction voltage, and spark testing. Aerospace wire and cable have to be able to handle lightning strikes. It's not something you have to consider in your ground-based applications. Thermal and aging tests. This is where you have to look at, again, 25, 30 years of operational life and the wire sustained that entire duration. So I mentioned two major incidents uh, that led to the changes in how aerospace wire and cable were thought of. This is the first one, uh, TWA 800. In 1996, Boeing 747 exploded off the coast of Long Island, New York. All 230 passengers aboard perished. This was the most expensive salvage uh, reconstruction project in aviation accident history. The U.S. and National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, reconstructed the entire aircraft in the hangar. This is actually during the reconstruction process of this aircraft. What the investigators found after reviewing all the evidence was that arcing between power wires and the fuel quantity indicator system, wires that are in the fuel tank in order to identify the amount of fluid still in the tank, the power wires arced, ignited fuel vapor, and caused the explosion of that aircraft. Second accident that happened two years later was Swiss Air 111. 223 passengers perished on this aircraft. The investigators found that a rapid succession of electrical fires led to the loss of control of the aircraft and eventual crash. What the investigators found was that an aftermarket modifier placed the gambling system on the emergency power bus. If the power got lost, that people who were gambling in first class, they didn't want them to lose power. That compromised the risk assessment and the airworthiness of the aircraft. So when the pilots cut off all power to all systems, the people in first class could still gamble, but the plane crashed. Not worth it. The investigation and the Canadian Transportation Board that investigated this crash said that the aircraft certification standards for material flammability were inadequate and that they allowed the use of materials that could be ignited and sustain and propagate fire. These two accidents brought together uh, law members of industry, Boeing, Airbus, wire manufacturers, aftermarket modifiers, and operators within the aerospace industry to come up with a way to better handle wire system design and sustainment. Whenever you talk about aircraft wire and cable, this term comes up, EWIS, Electrical Wire Interconnection Systems. And this contains, it includes all your wire, cable, connectors, relays, circuit breakers, power buses, all the materials that transfer the power from the generation to where the power is used. From a, a regulatory perspective for commercial products, this does not include fiber optic cable. The U.S. military considers that fiber optic cable should be part of this. The reason for the differentiation is that the FAA certification side for commercial product is looking for power and damage that can happen. Uh, from a military side, it's also looking at a little bit more of the functionality and how that can compromise the airworthiness of the aircraft. So from the, I mentioned the certification requirements. The FAA, about 10 years after the incident, that I mentioned it before, released a new set of wire requirements, a new set of standards that manufacturers and operators had to show uh, compliance with in order to operate the aircraft and then in terms of a manufacturer, sell their aircraft in the market. 
these new set of requirements had the OEM document all components that are designed for the operation within the environment that they're installed. What this means is that you have to make sure that whatever wire or connector is in the fuel tank has to have evidence and documentation showing that it will last the entire length of the aircraft or that it is a life-limited part and needs to be changed out after a certain period of time. This chart here is from one of their guidance documents and provides a step-by-step -step process as to what needs to be considered. From a, a quick cursory view here, the, the main considerations are the functional failure, what happens with the loss of the wire and the connectors, and also the physical failure. If you have a electrical arcing failure and wire starts to generate an arcing plume, how much damage can be done to nearby systems? If the wire harness is routed within one inch or two inches of a fuel tank, can the energy released puncture or ignite the fuel inside that fuel tank? These are real considerations that manufacturers are, are looking at this now. It is affecting their selection of wires and cables to be placed into their designs. Uh, they also have to consider EMI protection. When you're flying at 500 miles per hour, you can't just have interruptions in your signal and in your autopilot system. So EMI is a very important consideration here. These are just four points with regard to the certification requirements, but there's many, many more. So that, that gives you a little bit of background as to where the industry is, but looking forward as to the applications and some of the challenges that, that we're starting to see in the aerospace industry, the old design for aircraft distribution and electrical power was to run the power from the generators and the engines up to the cockpit at the front of the aircraft and then run the power back through the rest of the aircraft, which if you can see the aircraft on the left side of the dodo, wire runs up to the front and then may run all the way to the back of the aircraft. Seems like an awful waste of cable and uh, poor system design. With better solid state relays and better controls, the new design is to have the power get generated at the engines, come into the main body of the aircraft, and then go to several distribution centers within the aircraft. This is a modular design that allows the manufacturer to easily increase or decrease systems that are in a particular environment, can be easily controlled from the cockpit, adds digital protection to each of the circuits, which thereby makes it a much safer aircraft, and can allow for easier redundancy, and that power can be brought to the same location through multiple paths. This means that you have less heavy power feeder cable running from the engines all the way to the cockpit. But because you have all these distribution centers, this increases the amount of signal cable that's running through the aircraft. Typically, this is done on new aircraft design, but it can be applied to existing aircraft. It's just that the weight benefits of this are not as great. Another thing that we're starting to see in the aircraft design is higher voltage systems. Up till about five years ago, the highest voltage that you would see from line to neutral would be 115 volts. They're starting to move to higher voltages. Right now, the Boeing 787, they are using electrical actuators for the movement of their control surfaces. The benefit here is that you can remove a lot of the heavy hydraulics that used to control the flight control surfaces. The benefit with the higher voltages is that you can use smaller gauge wires. As we heard with some of the presentations earlier today, if you go to higher voltages, well, you don't need as much of a conductor to get the power to your components. However, since the 1970s, wire installations on aerospace cables and wires have been dramatically reduced. They're about as third as thick today as they used to be back then. These reduced weight, these thin-walled constructions have not been tested at these higher voltages. That is a large concern. Beyond that, if you're operating at 270 volts and you're using a thin-walled construction, well, you may need to increase the thickness of the wire in order to get the proper dielectric strength and the material strength necessary in order to last all 25 years. Well, if you need to increase that insulation thickness to achieve that, you've lost the weight savings that you got because you went to a higher voltage. So that's some of the trade-offs that they're currently looking at. Uh, I mentioned uncer uh, uncertain service life of the wires and cables. The dangers from electrical arcing are greater. There's more energy available that can cause damage to systems that are farther away. 
and also the challenges that they're starting to see are they're going to have to select different relays and also spacing of seal and sealing of connectors is starting to become an issue. As you get to higher voltages, the, the gap necessary increases. If you ever been on a regional jet, you know how little space they have on those aircraft. Uh, some of the current challenges that we're starting to see, they all pick on the Boeing 787 again. With, between their four power generators, there's over one megawatt of power on that aircraft. That goes to entertainment systems, uh, air conditioning, flight control surfaces. There's a lot of power, and if there's an electrical failure, that power can cause a lot of damage. These wire systems have not been certified to these higher voltages. About two years ago, the SAE, the group that oversees a lot of the wire and cable standards for aerospace, they removed the certification for 600 volts from most of their cables because there came the realization that there was no test to designate that being a 600 volt system. And that's one of the challenges that the industry is currently facing. Another challenge that we're starting to see is the application of the effects of corrosion preventative compounds, or CPCs. The common practice in aerospace is in order to avoid corrosion on structural components, these chemicals, these corrosion preventative compounds, will be released into the aircraft through a fogging system. This gets onto the wiring and changes the flammability of the wiring system. Recent research completed by the FAA found that there is a significant difference with these corrosion preventative compounds on the insulations. Another challenge that we're starting to see is more high voltage testing on wire system components, which you'll typically get with the initial design or while the aircraft's in the field. The harness is pulled out and connected to a test system. The system will then run 500 or 1500 volts on each of the wires and look for a short from wire to wire or wire to ground. The question now that the industry is faced with is if you hit these wires regularly every you know, month, two months, year with these high voltage pulses, how does that degrade the overall reliability of the wiring system? And right now, Electromech is doing work with the U.S. Navy in order to help quantify this effect. And another challenge that we're starting to see, system sustainment. The objective is to have aircraft fly longer, continue to use that equipment for as long as possible. And I'll actually talk about that here in a couple slides. Some of the new emerging technologies and products that we're seeing are the use of carbon nanotubes uh, and carbon nanotube cables. The manufacturers claim up to 70% weight savings over the copper core cables. Now, this is, again, a, a huge savings from a power distribution perspective. It's a huge savings from a weight perspective. And we've seen this application mostly on spacecraft. Another product that's coming out is the high flex cables for your flaps, landing gears, doors, in order to prolong the life of those components. High flex cables and high flex conductors are starting to be used to extend that mechanical life of the components. Next item is the increased use of molded harnesses. The idea here is that an entire harness is constructed from connector to connector and it's basically encased in a polymer, sometimes a vulcanized rubber, in order to protect that harness. The typical application of this is in a harness that's in a more moisture prone, maybe a hydraulic fluid environment. And this technology, it's been around for a couple decades, but the uh, viability of it and the manufacturing process behind this have approved to a point where we're going to see this more likely on aircraft. Over here on the right side, you see a close up of a twisted shielded pair. This is an example of a seamless construction. The idea is on the outside of the cable, there is a wrapped insulation here that's polyamide. On top of that is a Teflon coating. What you typically see with non seamless constructions is that there's a little lip where the wrap of the Teflon um, ended. The reason that this seamless construction is start beginning to be used a lot in aerospace is that during installation, these wires and cables will be pulled through the aircraft pulled across structure and clamps, and that tiny lip would be caught on the structure, and it would start ripping into the cable and reducing the, the viable life of that wire on the aircraft. With the use of the seamless construction, you don't run into that problem as much, and installation problems decrease significantly.
Uh, as I mentioned at the start, weight is very important, and there's a lot of technologies and a lot of applications that are looking to reduce the weight. One way that they're doing it is to use odd wire gauges. Typically, your wires are produced to 20 gauge or 22 gauge. And one means of reducing weight is to go to odd wire gauges. For example, here we see a 22 versus a 23 wire gauge. The weight reduction is between 10 to 15 percent, and the impacity reduction is about 15 percent. The benefit here from a designer perspective is that if I have a system that only needs, say, 3.5 amps, but doesn't need the cable for a 5 amp circuit, you can go to this lower wire gauge and get that weight savings. This poses a lot of challenges for maintainability. Most of your maintenance shops have even wire gauge tools for crimping, stripping, and so forth. So this is something that the industry is going to have to look for ways to handle. What, we're also, what we've seen uh, in a number of applications is copper-clad aluminum conductors. This is typically for your power feeder cables. Uh, there's a lot of large weight savings there, but for those who know the history behind aluminum conductors, there's also a risk going with aluminum conductors. This particular technology is used on some of the newer Airbus designs, and the way that they handled that maintainability issue was that as part of their release of the product, they also release tools and guidance to each of their maintainers. Here's how you need to handle these cables. Uh, these you handle differently than the typical technology that was used before. As I mentioned uh, in the last slide, nanotube cables, were, uh, again, mostly for space applications because there is that large cost driver to get lightweight components on there. I'm not sure how much longer it will be before we start seeing this on aircraft, but as the technology and the cost of nanotubes decreases, I expect to see more of it. One of the design choices that Airbus made in the construction of the A380 was in order to save weight, they decided to run their wires to the maximum ampacity. There's a lot of formulas and recommendations on how much power you can run through a particular harness. What's the temperature increase that you're going to see if you run from the tip of the wing to the center of the fuselage? If you run all those wires to that max current carrying capacity, they're going to fail. They're going to overheat and cause a failure of the system. The reason Airbus decided this was, again, to go with smaller gauge wires. They compensated for that heating problem by running air conditioning to cool those wire harnesses. They made that design choice. And the consequence of that is now that their air conditioning system is now a mission critical system. If the air conditioning fails on the aircraft, it's potentially a hazardous or catastrophic event. But some of the developments from a wire and cable perspective is the starting to look at the outgassing of cross-link ETFE constructions. But your space designers trying to get your payloads into orbit found that, well, let me step back a moment. When constructing a satellite, the typical process is to design, then build all the components, and then when all the components are available, put them all together and then get it off to the pl launch platform. What they found was that for systems using cross-link ETFE wire, the problem that they faced was they create these harnesses, place them in plastic bags, and leave them there for a year or longer. During that time, the cross-link ETFE wires would outgas fluorine. This fluorine would then create hydrofluoric acid, which could then damage the surfaces of fiber optic cables and could also lead to corrosion of these silver-plated conductors and silver-plated shielding. There's been a lot of research on this, a lot of work done by the Air Force Research Lab and the University of Dayton behind this problem. And some of the manufacturers are starting to come out with low fluorine outgassing products. There's a whole lot of other problems associated with that, but I won't get into it during this presentation. It's a little bit odd that for aircraft where flammability is a huge concern, flammability for wire and cable is still not well defined. The FAA has a certain set of tests that they're recommending. There's a test that the SAE has, but that may change in the next year based upon some additional research. We're looking to see how different processes for assessing the flammability of wires affect their certification. 
and it may affect the law of manufacturers because of that. One of the other developments that uh, actually I heard just a couple months ago was that there is no industry definition for acceptable damage to silver top coats of delivered products. What we found, what was happening was a wire manufacturer would deliver a silver plated cable, that was a shielded cable, was silver plated on the shield. The user of that cable examined the plating of that shield and found that there were a number of manufacturing defects. The manufacturer and the equipment manufacturer went back and forth for a while trying to find what is an acceptable level of damage to silver plated shielding and in fact silver plated conductors. My experience with aviation is that things usually take a lot of time. and This probably won't have a solution for at least five years. And again, one of the concerns is how they handle higher voltage cables. Region Rojas, restriction of hazardous substances and the European equivalent for removing these hazardous substances from the manufacturing process and from the end products. These are impacting the aerospace industry. What an aircraft manufacturer needs to consider is that if they follow the local requirements, say Boeing only follows the Rojas requirements, and they try to sell the aircraft to Europe, they may not be able to sell it because they may not be able to prove that their system lacks all those other substances that the European Union has identified as being hazardous. They sell that aircraft to an American customer, they may not be able to land in Europe or another region because of the exact same requirements. So it's important from their perspective to ensure that their systems, their wire cable, and all of their equipment meets those global standards. From a wire and cable perspective, this requires changes to insulation polymers, conductors, and all supporting equipment around connections in the overall wiring system. Uh, so getting away from the individual components and looking back at the system level, System sustainment is a large issue for not only the operators, but also military platforms. Back in 2012, Electromech started working with the U.S. Air Force for the creation of a handbook, Mill Handbook 525, as a guidance document that can help for platform sustainment. It's basically a seven-step process that defines the risk posed by aging wiring systems. It starts with data collection, gathering the wire system information, and doing an impact analysis. A lot of your older platforms are not gonna have that risk assessment information. So when you're selecting what parts of the aircraft need to be replaced, should it be your flight critical system or your coffee maker? And it's, it's pretty easy to make that determination. But that information needs to be generated and the risk assessment needs to be performed. Second task along this process is data mining. These aircraft have been flying for a while. A lot of the information that's been entered into the maintenance databases for these aircraft. That information can be gathered and help direct the overall inspection that's done in task three. Then you get to task four, that's when components are removed from the aircraft. This includes your wire systems, your circuit breakers, relays, all the wire system components to identify how much longer those components are viable on the aircraft. If you have a good understanding of the component or the material, then it's possible to come up with a life projection. If you have a degradation model that says, okay, based on my current condition and on the operating environment for this system, I expect this component to last for another 10 years. Then the operator can direct their budget, they can start planning for this phased approach and be able to address the risk before it actually impacts airworthiness. Then beyond that, you do a risk assessment, take the probability of failure, gather from tasks two through four, and then the system failure severity, and generate a overall risk assessment for the aircraft. Come up with an action plan, and then come back periodically to ensure that the processes have been followed and the recommended limited life of the components has been observed. So to, to wrap up here, what's the future as we see it for aerospace wiring cable and the overall wiring system? It's the same as ever, same market drivers, the continued need for better performance insulators. And this is with regard to not only the higher voltage item that I talked about during this presentation, but also higher temperatures. If an operator can run a higher temperature on the cable for the entire life, that gives them more leeway and better range of currents that they can put on and better operating environments that they can put that wire into. There's also gonna be additional scrutiny of the wires and their sources. 
there's a lot of push now to ensure that the components and the raw materials that go into wire and cable are known. Some countries are restricted as to where those materials can be put into the completed product. And this is also part of any sort of ISO manufacturing process. Just need to know where all of your system components came from. There's also going to be an increased regulatory requirement. This is going to be from FAA, EASA, the European equivalent, that needs more and more system-level assessments of wiring systems. So from wiring cable manufacturers, if you're able to show that your wires are able to perform better, longer, and uh, pose less risk to the aircraft, that helps the operator show compliance for regulatory agencies. Also expect to see more distributed power systems. Solid state relays are a proven technology, and that means there's going to be less power feeder cable on aircraft. The flip side of that is that there's going to be uh, more control cables that run to these distribution points. You're also going to see more sensors put onto aircraft, looking for fuel leaks, looking for shock if the aircraft lands too hard. That information will now be gathered. There'll be more information gathered on the thermal agent of particular zones. These sensors are going to get into the aircraft. They will probably at some point be integrated into the composite construction of the aircraft. As I mentioned at the first point about better performing insulators, the aircraft are going to run more harsh environments, higher temperatures, exposure to more fluids, and a lot of the challenges that they're facing, the maintainers at least, are different cleaning compounds, uh, de-icers, these new fluids that are used to clean structure, cleaning the cabin. These are having an impact on the wiring system, and that's better performing polymers, better handling of the system. And then lastly, looking from cradle to the grave, the, there's going to be a greater emphasis on system sustainment and platform longevity in order to get those aircraft flying longer there's going to be a need to make sure that the wire and all the supporting equipment can sustain that entire aircraft service life. And with that, that covers the presentation. Thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now or later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,